Hey everybody, buongiorno. Good to see you all. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, talking to everybody. But don't be shy. Come say hi and uh, tell me about yourself. And let's uh, let's let's hang out. Let's talk about cool stuff and uh, have a good time in Italy. Uh, I prepared this talk called "Stay Together for the Kids: Why System Package Managers and Language Package Managers Struggle to co Cooperate." I, sometimes I see a conflict on the internet where uh, I see people who are m more used to using one or the other and they don't always see the perspective from the other side. And so I want to share um, some of the interesting problems that both people face and kind of tell a story about how maybe we're actually on the same side. Maybe there's a way to get along. Uh, so, uh, yeah. My, uh, you, you know me, I'm Andrew Kelly, uh, famously known for creating uh, Groove Basin. <laughs> uh, Groove Basin is a music player server that looks about like this. It uh, has auto DJ, you can skip songs, multiple people can listen at the same time. Uh, it's kind of fun, you can, uh, it's, it's, a nice, it's a nice thing to listen to music with each other. And uh, I, I wrote a little bit about this um, on my on this blog post, which I, which was, um, let's see, eight years ago. Dear Lord, I'm old. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I I was looking through this uh, blog art uh, blog article lately, and I I wrote this part about packaging here. And uh, it's interesting to think about now because I've I've been on uh, one side of the journey of trying to maintain system packages, and I've also now been on the other side of of the fence where I'm looking into making a language package manager. Um, so uh, after I made this uh, music player server, I wanted to make it very easy for people to install it. And uh, you know how. What's an easier way to install it than just say you know, apt get install or you know equivalent on whatever uh, you're in? But the most popular Linux distribution is Ubuntu and Debian. Same same thing. If you get it into Debian, it's in Ubuntu. Um, so that's where I wanted to get it. So naturally, uh, I I went through the process. I sent a message to the Debian people and said I I want to become one of you. Help me help me become a a, a package maintainer. And they're very friendly, and they helped me do all these things. And uh, I went through this process. So uh, Debian is uh, it's a Linux distribution that cares very much about their free software guidelines. Um, it's restrictive in a way. You know, they have um, uh, famously could not have uh, the Firefox logo, so they had to change it to Ice Weasel. Get it? Uh, but it's all for a good reason. They have these free software guidelines um, because it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a um, code of conduct that a lot of people can, can come together, agree with, and, and derive value from. So, okay, let's dive in. Let's, uh, let's, let's go for the D Debian free software guidelines. Let's do it by the books. So I get in there. I need to package my music player. It's a Node.js application, which has, you know, a large tree of node modules. We'll come back to that. Um, but it also needs to play music. So it has native bindings for a C library that I wrote. And that C library needs to depend on other C libraries. Uh, and FFmpeg, already packaged for Debian, no problem. Chroma print, already packaged for Debian, no problem. So I kind of I cut my teeth on uh, lib eber128. This is. Um, a uh, loudness detection uh, algorithm. So it's a, it's a standard by the um, European Broadcasting Union. And it's a standard that helps you, if you look at a, a song or, or a, a broadcast, it can tell you how loud is it. How should we adjust the gain so that it is a standard volume? Um, anyway, uh, I did that. that. That worked pretty well. I followed the Debian software guidelines. I got the package in there. I learned how to do all this stuff. A few weeks later, no problem. Okay. Next, I packaged up uh, my music player uh, backend, libgroove. It, it, it manages a playlist and it lets you put songs on it, and it, it will 
use FFmpeg. It will use these lower level things and put audio through the speakers or encode audio so that you can, you can share it and that sort of thing. Again, a C library pr fits pretty well with the Debian packaging system. No problem. Got that going after a couple weeks. Next, uh, I had to uh, package up these Node.js bindings so that I could use libgroove from Node.js. This is some C++ code that kind of glue code that ties these things together. No problem. That, that worked. OK. But now I have the problem <laughs> where the Debian free software guidelines were not happy with my large tree of Node modules. Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, I don't know if anyone recognizes this particular function, um, but this was an actual dependency of my project. Uh, I don't know why, um, because uh, my, my dependencies were reasonable. Like I just needed WebSockets. Uh, I wanted Browserify so that I could, uh, I wanted to um, have the search feature on the client side work, but I also needed to be able to do the same search on the server side, so I wanted to share JavaScript code so I used Browserify to uh, help me have the same code work on both the server and the browser. I needed some zip file stuff, a database. It's a very reasonable things, and but the, the tree just exploded in dependencies. And the problem with trying to get these packages onto Debian is that they had conflicting rules that made it impo literally impossible to package. Because if there was a small package such as Leftpad, they would say, no, it's too small. You can't use that one. OK. So I'll just copy it into my project. No, 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 you can't copy code. That's against the rules. <laughs> well, what am I supposed to do? They never solved this problem. I, I, asked, I, I, I was asking all the, the Debian mentors and, and the people who were, who were good at this, like, well, what am I supposed to do then? And nobody had an answer. They didn't actually have a solution for this problem. Um, so what I ended up doing was re-implementing all my dependencies myself. <laughs> so I made, this, uh, I made this project called Browserify Lite. You've probably never heard of it because it's not important. It just it implements Browserify, but just a little bit worse. Uh, and in, I don't know, like 300 lines of code instead of, and, and no dependencies instead of a giant, giant tree of dependencies. But it was good enough for my project. So I switched to this dependency, and I, and I sliced a big chunk off my, uh, off my dependencies. And the, the, weird, the funny thing about this is that, I mean, you can see, I, I put the screenshot here, and you can see how, kind of how popular the project is, right? Like uh, 13 stars, including my own. You know, <laughs> this, is, this, this is not a popular project. But uh, I think there's like five or six packages in Debian that have nothing to do with me that now depend on this project. <laughs> Which, if you think about it, is a little bit alarming because the upstream developer, they didn't ask for this. They're trying to depend on the real Browserify. And then when their, pack, when their software gets onto Debian, all of a sudden the Debian maintainer is just yanking out their actual dependency and saying, here, we have Browserify at home. <laughs> Browserify at home. <laughs> so <laughs> you can see this conflict uh, start to arise between the upstream uh, per packages and the, the system packages. But for my story, I, I went through this long process that I think it took, I don't know, eight, eight nine months, where I did Browserify. I rewrote the static web server that I depended on so that I used my own that uh, did not uh, t have as many dependencies. I forked a bunch of, I, I, mean, I, tr I tried to work with the developers to prune some of their dependencies, but a lot of people said, man, get lost. Like, I, I doing it my way. Why, why are you coming in and telling me how to manage my project? I'm like, okay, fair enough. So I just forked their projects, rewrite some of their code, and just not depend on as much stuff. Um, yeah, I did my own WebSocket implementation. I went through the whole RFC. Uh, and it took a long time. It took almost a year to package my music player for Debian. Uh, even though it already worked, it took a year to just get it into Debian. And so back to this tree, I, I finally got this done <laughs> by, I mean, doing a lot of work specifically to make it work for Debian. Uh, and 
I got it in. We had Groove Basin and Debian. It lasted about four years, but then I, I lost the momentum of maintaining it. It bit rotted, it's gone. It's not there anymore. So all that work is like, was it worth it? I don't know, maybe. I, I learned something. Uh, but that's my story. Uh, now I want to try to zoom out and tell the story of um, these two different categories of, of, uh, of package managers. So we have the system package manager, which is your apt, your homebrew, uh, your uh, name some, can people name some more, yum, what else? Chocolatey, Pac-Man, Pac Emerge, Emerge, there we go, yeah. What was this? Yeah, Nix OS, or just Nix, yeah. Which one? Palladius, wow, I've never heard of that one. <laughs> OPG, yeah, I don't know that one either. OpenWRT has a package sure, ma manager? Sure. Wow, OK. Uh, OK, so that's the system ones. And then the, the language-specific ones is your, your NPMs, your Cargos, your uh, CPAN. Uh, what's some more? Nix. What? No, not Nix. Nix? Oh, which one's that for? Elixir. Elixir has Mix. OK. Pip? Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, so we, we know what we're talking about. Um, and also, this, this picture here, what is this? This is a Venn diagram. All right, let's get a Venn diagram on here. Uh, so I, I think what it comes, this is, this is the interesting picture that I like to think about. The, the language package managers and system package managers, they serve the same users, some of the same users. They both serve application users. But then they also have primary, uh, primary responsibilities to a slightly different category of users. But it's interesting because they do share some of the same users. And this is why I think that the analogy with, with parents fighting is kind of interesting because like there are the, the application users are the kids. You know, I hate it when my parents fight. Uh, <laughs> but it's understandable, right? Because they have, they have different responsibilities. The primary responsibility of the language package manager is to the person working on the upstream application. That's the primary um, primary user of, of, that, of that system. And yes, the application is ultimately for the application users, but the language package manager is directly for the upstream application developers. Um, and then on the other side, for the system package managers, it's interesting here that we have system users outside the bubble, and then we also have application users inside, because those can be the same people. Like maybe I'm a system user, but I'm also a user of the application. But you kind of switch hats, right? You can put on your hat and say, I mean, how many of us have installed an application? We want to use the application, but we're not in love with the application. We don't fully trust that they're, you know, I don't want to like curl pipe it to SH their application. I want to install it from apt where I know that if I get it from Debian, it probably passed some, some checks. You know, they probably checked out the license stuff and they made sure that it didn't have malicious code in it. I have a lot of trust for the applications in apt. A lot more, I have a lot more trust if I get it from apt than if I get it directly from the upstream application developer. And when I, when I take that attitude on, I become a system user. But let's say I'm, I don't know, I'm a 3D modeler and I, I depend on Blender. You know, it's my life and blood and I, I need the latest greatest version of Blender, I, I'm, I'm all about, like, that's my, that's my thing. Now I'm more of an application user. Maybe I want to get Blender directly from upstream. Maybe I don't care about getting it from Debian. Why, why would I care about that? I, I, I'm more tied to the application than I am to the system. So we can kind of switch hats as a user and become a system user or an application user. It, it's a weird way of looking at it. Um, I've been saying stream a lot, so just in case uh, anyone's not caught up on this, uh, here's, a, here's a nice little picture of a stream, in case you didn't know what one of those are. Uh, <laughs> but in, anyway, point is the code starts out with the original project source. It flows, the code flows down the stream to the end users. And so often if we say upstream, we're talking about someone who's primarily responsible for the code, and we're going to get the code from them and do something with it, and then pass it on to the next person down the stream. So when we... Uh, when we use packages from our system, uh, we're, we're, 
we're kind of it's it's almost like a level of abstraction where the original authors take the source and um, and maybe it's actually you know a fork. Maybe there is a fork to uh, fix you know some kind of licensing issue, and now and then it goes into the Debian maintainers, and maybe they have a patch to make it work better with the rest of your system, and then finally the end user gets it. So that's it's kind of a level of abstraction, and but it's possible to also just download a binary from an upstream uh, application developer, in which case uh, you're you're kind of cutting out the middleman. So for example, if you go to zigling.org slash download and you just grab one of those, those binaries, you're skipping the whole stream process. You're just getting zig from upstream, which is the zig project. But a lot of people will have a different experience. They're going to get it from a system package. So they're going to experience the code going through a few layers of, of abstraction uh, before they get to use it. Um, so back to this little diagram here. Um, I think it's worth pointing out that there's a slightly different relationship to these application users. Um, with the language package manager, the primary purpose is to help the application developers. And yeah, you know, the application users, they, they could use the language package manager, but they're not, not really directly the beneficiary. That's a little bit more indirect. Whereas with the system package managers, they, are, they do more directly have the user's interest in mind. So let's try to look at an example here. Um, I like to think about system package managers and language package managers as uh, kind of like you know these these rectangles here, and you can see that they 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 have a different cross section. So if I'm looking at um, if I'm on Debian, I'm looking at apt. The apt system is going to have Binutos, Firefox, libc, gcc, and and our application that we will uh, kind of. Uh, a case study here is a uh, this thing's dead. <laughs> is a uh, rip grab. Oh, you have another one ready? No, I, yes, but you just need to keep it closer to your mouth. Oh, closer. Okay, yeah. Uh, so uh, rip grab is our example here. Now rip grab is cross-platform. This is a, a Rust project that works on uh, Linux, Mac OS, FreeBSD. I don't know. Uh, is, has uh, Agni has rip grab been ported to Serenity? OK, someday. <laughs> uh, and I'm pretty sure it works on Windows. So there's all these, there's this kind of vertical concerns of RipGrep. The application uh, developer cares about all these platforms. But on the other side, uh, if, if we're looking at you know, apt in Debian, they don't care about Windows. They care about all of their making RipGrep work with all of their stuff. So for example, if I were to, instead of apt, I was to talk about NixOS. NixOS is going to have patches uh, to make sure that when you install ripgrep on NixOS, it, uh, it gets the correct dynamic linker. That's not something that matters on Windows. But on, uh, from the ripgrep developer's perspective, they're not thinking about NixOS, they're not thinking about, oh, how, how is my ripgrep package going to properly integrate with the GCC flags that the rest of the system has? No, no, no. They, they're looking at a different cross-section. They're looking at all the operating systems and saying, how can I make my software work the best on all of these operating systems? It's a different way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. And they just have that one thing in common, which is the ripgrep package. Uh, so for example, if I, if I slide this window up, now we can look at Homebrew with Mac OS. We're still talking about RipGrep, but now the system of packages that, or the, the set of packages that we're looking at is different. Now it's Clang instead of GCC, and now uh, you know, wh whether or not we have to integrate with libc is, is a different story because they have it built into the, to the system. Um, so there's, there's a particular pattern that can happen where this breaks down. And here's two situations where you can, here's, I want to give you two examples. One, I think it's easier to empathize with the, um, with the uh, application developer using the language package manager. But in the second one, it's easier to empathize with the, the system package maintainer trying to solve a CVE. So in the first case, let's say I'm working on, uh, I'm working on ripgrep and I find a bug. And I find out that actually the bug is in one of my dependencies. I was using a, I don't know, red-black tree, uh, and they had a 
mis like a you know if you do a certain pattern of additions and removals from from the uh, from the data structure, it does the wrong behavior. Critical problem, and it got fixed. So that version, they they bump it a little bit. Now, if I'm a ripgrep developer, what do I need to do? All I need to do is go into my my package manager manifest and bump up the dependency and say, well, a uh, red black tree needs to go from you know one point 0.1 to 1.0.2, make sure that we get at least that version, and I can close this bug. It's solved because I've declared that we must depend on that version. Okay, but then things don't always go so smoothly. You know, as we learned from the fact that anyone uses browserify lite at all, what, by the time your software makes it into the, the system, the package maintainer might say, well, this package is asking for 1.0.2, but you know, tough luck, we only have 1.0.1, .1. deal with it. And so now the upstream application developer is thinking, hey, what the hell, I fixed this bug by declaring that I need this dependency where the bug's fixed, and then what did you do? You just pulled it out from under me and then, and then give me the wrong dependency version, and now people are filing bugs on my issue tracker saying that I have this bug that I fixed already. Like, what's going on? You know, that's a very frustrating experience from the, from the language package manager perspective. Okay, let's, let's turn things around the other way. Let's say that there's a CVE, and the CVE, uh, it, it's in uh, some core important library, like, um, I don't know, Zlib is the classic example. And it's bad. It's a, it's a remote code execution. And everybody uses Zlib, so that's a big problem. And now I'm a system package maintainer, and I'm frustrated because I got this advanced notice on the CVE, and I'm trying to fix my system. I mean, I care about my system users. I, let's say I'm, I'm the Debian people. Well, I want Debian users to know, to have the security that all the packages they install will very quickly have the CVE patch installed. You know, this vulnerability should be gone within a day. That's the, you know, that's the ideal. But the problem is all these upstream applications are, are you know, vendoring code. They're just copying Zlib into their packages. Or, or it, maybe they're just using you know, a language package manager to install things, and they're not uh, going through the system package manager process. This CVE is impossible to fix. It's, it's intractable, because everyone's copy-pasting all these dependencies, and that bug just can't. I, I, you'll never be able to tell your users, it's fine, we patched the CVE. You just never would be able to say that. In that situation, I kind of empathize with the system package maintainer. Um, I have a, a real world example. Uh, back to the uh, Node.js theming here. Uh, is anyone familiar with this drama? The user bin node versus user bin Node.js? Anybody? One, I see one person, yeah? Two? Three? Yeah, interesting. Four? OK. Uh, well, anyway, so it's, it's, it's a funny story. Um, so Debian's a pretty old Linux distribution. Before Node.js came around, uh, they, had, they already had a package for ham radio, I don't know, hobbyist ham radio stuff uh, that had user bin node. You're, you're a node in the radio space. I don't, I don't know. I'm not a ham radio user. Uh, but they, they had this username, uh, sorry, this uh, binary name taken already. And the Node.js project uses node as the um, as the binary name, instead of, I don't know, Node.js, the actual name of the project. Uh, I actually suggested on the mailing list back in, what is this, uh, 2013, you know, a little spicy of a title, I'll admit, but I, I, I sent a message to the Node.js uh, uh, mailing list, like, hey, maybe we should compromise, you know? Maybe we should actually uh, just, like, work with you know, pick a better name that's less ambiguous, and uh, then we won't have this problem with Debian. And uh, they, they were not having it. They were, that, that was not a um, welcome suggestion. Um, but I mean, I think this is an interesting case because, you know, upstream, the Node.js developers, understandably, don't want to be told by some third party, like, you got to change your name, you know? and, and Node.js is much more popular, massively more popular than the ham radio software. Okay, so they have that point in their favor. But I mean, come on, what is, Node is such a generic word. Like Node.js is the name of the project. It's a pretty reasonable, you know, it would be a pretty reasonable compromise to have that be the binary. 
and it was pretty bad. Like, um, let me pull up my notes here. Okay, so let me let me just tell you how bad this was. Uh, every single Node.js package that made it into Debian was patched to change the shebang lines from user bin Node to user bin Node.js. If you use the Node.js package from Debian to install Node, you could not run npm install. You could not do normal development work using the Debian package of Node. It was unusable for just regular Node.js work. So nobody actually ended up installing Node through Debian. Um, it, the only purpose of the, uh, of the Node.js package in Debian was just so that any you know, packages like Groove Basin could even exist in Debian at all. So it was, it was a terrible situation for the users. And so, OK, I, I present all these problems to you. Um, do, and do I come to you with a solution? Well, what's the solution to marriage? There's, it's, a, it's a silly question. There's no solution. It's just, it's just compromise and hard work and mutual respect. Like, that's all, that's all there is to it. And if you do this, then you know, maybe you can have a happy marriage. And uh, you, know, you, can, you can have nice kids.